Next up on This Week in Law, we've got Debbie Halbert, AJ Shankar, Sarah Pearson, and me. We're going to talk about, of course, the net neutrality ruling from the FCC yesterday. Uh, we'll talk about Fair Use Week, the Power Rangers reboot, llamas running around. We'll say goodbye to Leonard Nimoy. Uh, we'll thank the Supreme Court for its references to Dr. Seuss and uh, in a Fox on Socks case, no less. All this and more coming up on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell and Sarah Pearson. Episode 294, recorded February 27th, 2015. Dingo Free FCC. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by Nitro. Nitro accelerates the way businesses create, prepare, and sign PDF files. Anytime, anywhere, saving you and your business time. To learn more and try it free for 14 days, visit gonitro.com slash twit. That's gonitro.com slash twit. And by FreshBooks, the easy-to-use invoicing software perfect for your law firm and designed to help small business owners save time in billing and get paid faster. Join over 5 million users running their business with ease. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash twill. Hi, folks. I'm Denise Howell, and you're about to join us for This Week in Law. We're so excited that you have done so. We've got a great panel of guests, and it has been a very busy week at the intersection of law and technology. Uh, we're going to get right to it and introduce you to our fabulous guests today. Uh, first of all, I will welcome back to the show my co-host, Sarah Pearson. Hello, Sarah. Hey, Denise. Happy to be here. Great to see you. Hope you had a good week last week. I did. It was cold, good, good. really cold in Toronto, but it was good. <laughs> well, you should be visiting Debbie because Debbie is a professor, uh, Debbie Halbert to be exact, is a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, where she focuses on IP law and policy. Hello, Debbie. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here as well. Great to see you. You know, I actually did a summer school session at UH Manoa, and uh, I've got to say it was probably the most memorable and best summer of my life. So you have um, a really wonderful position there. Uh, how long have you lived in Hawaii? This is my eighth year here, but I did actually do my graduate degree here in the mid 90s and then lived in Ohio for 12 years. So I appreciate both how cold it can be right now and also how nice it is here. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's where Sarah is in Ohio. Yeah. Uh, also, also joining us is AJ Shankar. AJ is the founder of Everlaw and uh, pays a lot of attention to machine intelligence uh, as it applies both to his best business and the tech industry in general. Hello, AJ. Hey, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Thanks so much for joining us today. Just so we uh, know where everyone is, um, you're up in Northern California, I'm guessing? Yep. Yep. Berkeley, California. It's pretty there nice we here. Go. It is wonderful there. Yes. All right. Well, uh, let's dive into it. A uh, uh, moment of, of silence and reflection before we start the show. Uh, learned this morning that Leonard Nimoy has passed and at the age of 83. And much as I expected him to live at least into his 130s, as DeForest Kelly was supposed to have done when he appeared on an early episode of The Next Generation, or possibly into, you know, well into his 200s. Uh, if he had lived up to his character's longevity on the show. Um, unfortunately, that did not happen. And he will be sorely, sorely missed. Uh, live long and prosper to everyone, uh, as I'm sure he would uh, pass along to all of his fans who are missing him and mourning him today. Um, we certainly are. And, and of course, uh, everyone at the Twit Network is, is uh, very, very saddened to hear this news. Uh, unlike um, some law and policy news that came down yesterday, and I think um, folks are much happier about that news, let's start the show there. All right, 
So the FCC uh, voted yesterday on the latest iteration of its open internet rules. Uh, it voted to adopt the rules. It gave us some parameters on uh, what the rules are going to include, uh, including um, an open internet in the sense that uh, there will not be throttling of data based on what sort of data it is. Uh, there will not be preferential pricing, no fast lanes. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, we've got a five-page uh, release from the FCC and a 300-page document that uh, fully outlines the parameters of the new open internet rules. Uh, we do know that uh, the FCC has decided to take the uh, step of reclassifying uh, internet services under Title II in order to give itself the authority that it needs to do the regulating that it wants to do. Um, so again, I mean, we really don't know the details uh, yet. Um, hopefully in the next uh, weeks uh, or <laughs> certainly in the next months, we will um, have the final, final document and be able to take a look. Uh, legal challenges will certainly be forthcoming. Although, Sarah, I'm certainly wanting this morning to go back and reread Verizon versus FCC and see exactly what the court, uh, the federal circuit there had to say about Title II and remind myself, um, certainly the, the federal circuit said, mentioned Title II as one of the possible ways the FCC could go. Um, there was another possible regulatory way they could have gone to that they eschewed. Uh, and they have a good deal more authority under Title II than they would otherwise have had, uh, don't they, Sarah? Yes, I think that's right. And I'm, I will also have to go back and read Verizon again, but um, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty clear that there will be more litigation around this, but it's a huge win. Um, it's a huge win for consumer advocates and groups like Free Press and EFF who have really, really done an amazing job of kind of uniting the public um, in a in an incredible way. I this morning I went back and watched the John Oliver bit about net neutrality, which was about a year ago now, and it was so interesting to me because um, the tenor of the discussion at that point was pretty. It didn't look good for net neutrality, um, and I don't know if that was the turning point, but it was really interesting to see it again now because I'd kind of forgotten how far we've come on this issue because there's been so much momentum for net neutrality in the last several months. So, yeah, or the turning point might have been uh, President Obama coming out True. and uh, throwing his hat in uh, on the Title II side and saying, you know, we really need to do this and ensure that uh, the FCC has the authority to enforce the open internet rules it wants to promulgate. Uh, AJ, I'm sure you've been paying attention to this. Uh, any thoughts or takeaways you want to give us? Uh, sure. Yeah, I would say one other, I wouldn't say there's a turning point, but I think one of the large factors was um, when the FCC opened it up for comments, you know, there was a kind of a groundswell uh, as far as a lot of smaller internet companies, you know, Reddit, even a lot of um, entities pushing people, I mean, encouraging people to write in. And a lot of people did. And, you know, overwhelmingly, the comments FCC got were in favor of net neutrality. And I think when you just listen to the big corporations, it's hard to tell, you know, there's potentially pluses and minuses. But when you see overwhelmingly consumers saying this is something that I really want, I think that definitely influenced at least Obama's thinking potentially, you know, the entire decision. Um, <clears throat> obviously, I think for a company, you know, we're a very small company. We're a startup. Um, for all the startups in any, you know, in any industry, this is a great ruling for us. Um, the the idea that as a small company with not a huge amount of capital trying to break into a new industry, it's terrifying if you can imagine um, an internet provider preventing you from getting to your clients, right, without coughing up big fees. So that's a huge win. Um, one other thing I will mention that I don't think you guys covered, another aspect of the ruling that's kind of interesting that may be overlooked mm -hmm. of it is it used to be um, that municipalities could not, in certain states, were not allowed to offer um, internet as a utility, as, like, as, as a kind of a government-sponsored utility. Uh, and now the FCC has ruled that they, they can, in fact, do that. So just as you have, you know, public energy and, you know, in some sense, public utilities, you can now have public Internet. Uh, at least they have the, the right to allow cities to provide that, which 
you know, for, for many consumers, maybe the only the second choice they're ever going to have in picking an internet provider. So two is, as you know, much, much better than one when it comes to competition. So I think that's another big win for consumers. Yeah, I totally agree. And it, it will be really interesting in, in the coming months to see how that pans out. It will be interesting in the coming years to see how the FCC's um, policy statement that it's going to forbear from um, trying to enforce or apply the various extraneous aspects of Title II uh, to its goal of uh, providing an open internet. Um, Title II would permit it to um, regulate a lot more deeply than is strictly necessary here. And, and the FCC is saying, no, no, we're going to take a hands-off approach and it will be interesting to see um, how that pans out, you know, as regimes change and uh, the reins of power uh, transition over the years. Uh, Debbie, can you weigh in on this? Well, I'd like to also reflect the vast number of people I think that commented did make a difference. I mean, there were over 3 million public comments. And for any regulatory agency, that's quite a bit. Normally, it's more agencies like the EPA that see that kind of public response. I think what that says, and of course, with President Obama also coming out in favor of it, that certainly helps. I think one of the things that's important to recognize is that there's a, a sort of larger conceptual debate that's happening between open and closed kinds of access, public versus private kinds of support. And one of the things you're seeing happening in the ways these comments work out is a clear preference on the part, at least of the public and those that are commenting for a much more open kind of system. Now, when we get into the technical details, and as you've already mentioned, this will inevitably spark a variety of different kinds of either legal challenges and or regulatory challenges, I'd imagine. Um, that's where the devil will, in the details will come out. And so it's worth still paying attention because it's much easier to mobilize people around a sort of broad-based concept of net neutrality. It's much harder to say when we get down to this specific language in this regulation that will ultimately structure the, the final way this works. How do we mobilize people to help support um, that level of politics? And so it's always an interesting way to look at it from a political perspective. And it's always nice to see when, when the public wins over those who are paying attention to this constantly. Uh, to the point of throttling, Sarah, uh, I think it's pretty clear based on what we've heard from the FCC so far that if you're a heavy P2P user, for example, that's not going to be a good enough basis uh, for an ISP to say, we're going to um, throttle your internet speeds. Um, how do you think data caps fare in all this? Um, actually, I don't have a good sense for that. I know that... Um so there's the 300-page document coming out, um, and I mm -hmm. didn't listen to the hearing yesterday. But one of the things um, that's going to be allowed is reasonable management of networks. And so mm -hmm. it's it's possible that data caps would fall into that, but um, I don't have a good sense. But it, I don't have a good sense either. I'm, I'm assuming that it would. Um, I, and here's here's – go ahead, AJ. What do you think? I actually don't think that data caps are going to change as a result of this ruling. Mm -hmm. um, the ruling it talks about the kinds of data that reach you, but not the volume of data that reaches you. So if you are mm -hmm. a user, if you're the the 0.1 percent that's using, you know, 30 percent of the bandwidth, I think the mm -hmm. ISPs are still going to be allowed to say this is too much. And what mm -hmm. they can't do is say that of the data you're using, certain kinds should be preferred over others. That's my understanding. Right. And here here's what we have from the FCC on reasonable network management. They say for the purposes of the rules. Other than paid prioritization, an ISP may engage in reasonable network management. This recognizes the need of broadband providers to manage the technical and engineering aspects of their networks. And then we have two clarifying bullets. In assessing reasonable network management, the commission's standard takes account of the particular engineering attributes of the technology involved, whether it be fiber, DSL, cable, unlicensed Wi-Fi, mobile, or another network medium. And then also, however... The network practice must be primarily used for and tailored to achieving a legitimate network management and not business purpose. For example, a provider can't cite reasonable network management to justify reneging on its promise to supply a, a customer with unlimited data. Uh, they may have as well have put in, uh, hear this, AT&T. <laughs> so uh, 
I don't, you know, that, that little clarifier at the end there, you have to have a, a legitimate network management and not a business purpose. Um, seems to me like data caps are pretty business purpose oriented, although um, maybe the case could be made that if we're going to let um, really heavy users bog down the network, then we are getting into network management issues. Is that what you're thinking, AJ? That is exactly what I'm thinking. So for instance, yeah. here, here's a legitimate network reason. So we are having a, we're having a Skype conversation right now. Mm -hmm. And it's well within the rights of our ISP and your ISP to prioritize kind of real-time multimedia because latency matters a lot here. Um, not necessarily the total amount of bandwidth allocated, but the rate at which packets get through, the latency involved, whatnot, um, over other kinds of data transmission that have fewer latency concerns, right? So they can tell this is a Skype stream, for instance, and if they're being really smart and nice, they might say, okay, we're going to prioritize this. And, I th and that is, a, I think fairly legitimate. Uh, for data caps, I completely agree with you when someone says something is unlimited and then they make it limited, you know, I would be pretty upset about that. But if, you know, Comcast will say you have up to 250 gigabytes on your residential plan, um, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure that that, when they explicitly state that, that that's going to go away. I think that as far as I know, that can stick around, but I'm, I'm certainly not confident about that. Right. So uh, definitely big news this week. We will continue watching um, as the actual open internet rules come out and consider the, the issues and fine points that they may raise. And of course, as the inevitable legal challenges come down the pipe. Um, let's go around here. And uh, if any of you have any final thoughts on the network neutrality news, now would be the time. Debbie? Well, I think I agree with the sentiment of everyone on the panel that it's been a good decision. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think, Sarah? You're glad that this happened? Yeah, I'm definitely glad this glad that this happened, and I'm interested to see where it goes from here. Okay, and AJ. I do have one more thing to add. Sorry, this is very near and dear to my heart. Um, Don't be sorry. I, I'm, I'm happy about where this went, and I think in particular one thing the FCC cited in the decision, which is really critical, I think, um, was. The fact that most people don't have a lot of options in their broadband providers was apparently to them a big factor in realizing they need to regulate this somewhat. When you have an open, when you have a completely free market with many, many um, providers, you can pick. If if net neutrality didn't exist, you could say, I want to prefer the one that doesn't charge extra, right? You have the luxury of picking, and that's what a lot of the ISPs try to say is, okay, it's a free market. You know, this is just another factor amongst many. But in reality, people have one, zero, one, or maybe two if they're very lucky options. Uh, and that is not a free market. In that case, you have to take whatever they give you. And I think the FCC was um, doing a particularly good job of recognizing that whatever we, when we talk about free markets, you really need to have options, and you don't here. So by providing the regulation, right. even the people who don't have these opportunities are going to get good service. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. And, and your business, we should mention, is pretty directly um, impacted by what happens here, right? You, you have a startup that relies on uh, being able to deliver a pretty bandwidth intensive service, I would imagine, as you're dealing with um, analyzing uh, piles and piles of data in the discovery, uh, the litigation discovery process, correct? Absolutely. I mean, we pay thousands of dollars a month for a dedicated fiber connection, but we know that our clients often can't afford that. And a whole law firm might be running on one Comcast cable business line, you know, mm -hmm. and the minute they start prioritizing one thing over another, when they have to get a lot of this data out, it's going to be a challenge. So I'm, I'm very happy that they're hopefully not going to do that. Right. It's not, it's a great example, your company and others like it that are not delivering vid video, but are doing um, analytics mm -hmm. uh, using our internet pipes um, and obviously passing a lot of information and data back and forth. Uh, that that can be a really uh, bandwidth intensive process too. Um, and something that, you know, is not just all of us looking forward to watching the next season of House of Cards. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> has an actual legitimate business uh, purpose going on there. And, and if, you know, if, if you're, if a company like yours is forced to um, pay tolls to get their data through, um, that, that could put a company like yours out of business, couldn't it? Yeah, we'd never get off the ground if we had to negotiate with every ISP just to get the data out there quickly enough. Right.
Um, so I feel like we're all pretty, um, <laughs> you know, waving the flag, join, joining the virtual dance party since we couldn't be in uh, D.C. Uh, in person. They actually threw a dance party in D.C. Um, <laughs> to celebrate the uh, decision. Uh, but I feel like, you know, before we leave the topic, we should at least sort of explore some of the counterpoints. I mentioned that, um, you know, we haven't seen the actual lengthy open internet rules there. So nobody really knows, you know, what sort of uh, things might be lurking in there that could be of concern. Um, what else? I, I, throughout this whole uh, debate, have, have had a really hard time um, saying that we shouldn't enable new business models uh, on the ISP front. And I'm totally with you, AJ, that, that that's an easier uh, argument to make when there's a lot more competition and that the business model that charges your company for the access um, has a good competitor in a business model that, that doesn't. Um, and I don't know that we're necessarily uh, in that spot, but, but it does seem like uh, competition is a good thing. Uh, experimenting with um, what people are willing to pay for and what people are not is a good thing. Uh, maybe this all comes down to the fact to all of the millions of comments um, on the proposed internet uh, rules that say that people feel like they're paying a lot already for their broadband services and don't want to have to um, pay additional tolls to get access to certain services. Uh, but AJ, are you at all persuaded by, by the folks on the side that say, you know what, this is um, government getting into an area where the free market should be able to shake things out? Uh, you know, as I said, I don't, I'm not persuaded. And I think primarily there's a lack of choice. And that to me, when you talk about free markets, you need choice. And this is the kind of thing where most people have very few options. I mean, my options where I live are Comcast at some reasonable speed and then AT&T at one fiftieth of that speed, you know, mm -hmm. that's not a good option for me. Um, so until, you know, when we have 10 options, by all means, let them sort it out. I'll be able to pick and, you know, hopefully everyone will be educated enough to make a good decision at that point. Um, but right now I have to take whatever I can get. And I'm, you know, I live in a very densely populated urban area, right? And I should have a lot of choices. I don't. So um, I do think, by the way, this is not going to change everything. So for instance, Netflix pays Comcast and Verizon, they pay appearing arrangements way down the network stack um, to get data mm -hmm. to us faster. Mm -hmm. Those are not going away. Those are not last mile uh, uh, situations like what, what the FCC is talking about here. So as far as businesses trying to get their data, you know, connections, uh, sharing data, you know, Netflix, as you know, has 30 or 50 or some absurd percent of uh, prime time data usage in, in the US. That's still gonna happen and those companies can work that out. You know, if, if they need to get faster connections, they can do that. But as far as getting data to me, the consumer at my house, um, until I have, you know, five or 10 options, I'm going to feel very comfortable in saying that I, I would like to make sure that the one option I have is serving my interests rather than, you know, as a consumer who's paying for the service rather than a particular company that's going to influence how it gets data to me. Right. Are, are you fairly comfortable that in that sort of ideal future world where there is more competition that the FCC would pull back? from uh, exercising its authority. As you know, it said it's going to forbear from enfor enforcing all aspects of Title II. Do you feel like um, you trust the FCC to say, okay, we think that there's sufficient competition and we're gonna go ahead and let you um, monkey around with how you're pricing things and we're gonna let you discriminate because there is adequate choice now. Do you see that happening? That is a great question, and I don't know. Um, we'll have to see how your example of Title II is a great is a great example. You know, I'm sure there's all kinds of horrible and annoying things they could do right now because mm -hmm. it's Title II, and if they are careful about not enforcing those things, I think that's a good first step. Um, as far as in the future, when there are many companies, you know, when when we have five broadband options, and for them to revisit this and say, okay, why don't you guys try playing around with this a little bit? Um, I prefer, of course, always having, you know, as far as being the head of a small company and, you know, in 10 years, we won't be a small company one way or the other, um, but there will be many more. So I would always prefer to have the opportunity for new businesses, new enterprises, new ventures to get, be able to take a launch easily. So I'm always going to be in favor of something where you don't charge extra money for this. Um, so as far as what they're actually going to do though, I couldn't tell you, I don't have any, I don't have any faith one way or the other in terms of who's going to be the head of the FTC, what the political climate is going to be in Washington, who's appointed whom, you know, impossible for me to say. 
Yeah, or for any of us for that matter. But uh, it's been obviously super interesting to watch this all unfold since 2010. This issue has been uh, wending its way through the FCC and the courts and will continue to do so. Uh, but right now, the advocates of net neutrality um, have a lot to celebrate and uh, will continue to keep you informed on the issue. Uh, what we'd like to keep you informed on as well uh, is the fact that it's Fair Use Week. So let's have a discussion that has to do with copyright. Fair Use Week. Uh, so unless you're a copyright wonk, you might not have been aware that uh, there is a designated week each week. I think Kyle Courtney... A uh, law librarian out of Texas may have been the brainchild of coming up with Fair Use Week. I don't think this is the first year that it's happened. Sarah, do you know more about the background than I do? It's definitely not the first year, but I don't actually mm -hmm. know the history of it. It seems like mm -hmm. the Association of Research Librarians is heavily involved. I don't know if they were the impetus for it originally or not, but I know they're doing a lot of work on it this year and kind of corralling everyone to make sure people are blogging about it and planning events and that sort of thing. But I don't know if they were the originator. Um, Right, so it's a week to, to bring attention to uh, the doctrine of fair use and to highlight examples of fair use in action. And uh, there's been a lot of blogging on the topic. There are a lot of good examples to um, talk about just this week. Just yesterday, for example, uh, you know, it, it, we're always just so thrilled when we can bring things like llamas into the show <laughs> and, uh, and actually have a copyright basis for doing so. Um, I bet you are wondering how I'm managing to pull that together. Well, Kyle, Kyle Courtney, uh, the dude who is behind um, Fair Use Week, uh, highlighted a wonderful video. And I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't let the studio know I wanted to play a bit of this uh, before we started the show, but hopefully we can pull it up. Uh, because, uh, of course, um, it, unless you were nowhere near a computer or a television screen yesterday, uh, you know that um, uh, mama and baby llama were rampaging around Phoenix and uh, causing much uh, concern in rounding them up and, and much uh, lack of productivity in anybody's work life. Okay, so it's the second video, not the, the GIF, <laughs> GIF, however we were deciding, yes, that one. It's, here's a bit of fair use for you. We need the volume. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the the whole notion behind fair use is uh, there are four factors, and uh, I you know we would have to go through the whole legal analysis of uh, that one, and maybe we should. Maybe we should. Uh, we've got, after all, a copyright scholar on here with us. Um, we've got the uh, the obviously what's it called? I think Yakety Sax is the uh, Benny Hill <laughs> yeah. theme song, and uh, and llamas, and so we've got. Um, a, a newsworthy story, or apparently it was newsworthy. It was all over CNN yesterday, <laughs> interrupting their terrorism coverage. Uh, we've got a copyrighted work from an old TV show uh, mashed into um, glorious entertainment. What do you think, Debbie? Is it fair use? <laughs> Well, I would love for it to be fair use. And I think that we should structure our fair use doctrine so that something like this could be considered fair use. Um, and of course, I watched a whole video yesterday because it's adorable. And, and why would you not want to watch llamas rampaging around the city streets? Um, and, 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 and it's even more clever because of the way the music is merged with it. So this is something that different scholars like Jerry Jenkins have called convergence culture or what people call user generated content. Much of what goes onto YouTube are these these kinds of videos. So something that somebody has taken or found and clipped and merged and created something new, oftentimes with a soundtrack. And so one of the the sort of key factors for fair use, right, is the amount and substantiability and, and you know substance of what you've taken. So the question for this, well, assuming that the person who presented the video owned the video footage itself, is how much of the music itself was used and whether that would violate one of the prongs of fair use. So 
The problem, of course, with fair use is that we have to wait for a court to decide that. Uh, YouTube may decide on its own if it were to be put on YouTube by uh, taking it down if they received a notice that they had to under the Digital Millennium Copyright um, notice and takedown procedures. So it, it's despite the fact that we want fair use to be something that allows for creativity and sharing of knowledge and entertainment, oftentimes we can get bogged down in those details. Right, and I so think there's it's, no easy it's, answer. <laughs> right. No, you were you were making yeah. it way too easy uh, by saying, "Oh, let's just assume that the um, video is owned by the person who posted it." I don't think we <laughs> right. can assume that at all. I, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So there are multiple <laughs> layers of potential copyright violations, and yet the end result is this very clever video that clearly went viral, that everyone enjoyed watching, that nobody was trying, as near as I can tell, to make money or to monetize. And so there's mm -hmm. lots of different dimensions to how we look at creative culture in a digital age that still need to be addressed. And and we're using tools that were not created in a digital age to do it. Right. All right. Well, I want to get to another uh, piece of creative culture in the digital age uh, where there could be a strong fair use argument uh, in just a moment that will be near and dear to the heart of any Power Rangers fans. Uh, but before we go there, I'd like to thank our first sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law. And that is a new sponsor to the show. It is called Nitro. Nitro is the leading alternative to Adobe Acrobat. So if you are constantly using Adobe and looking for an alternative, hey, we've got one for you. It's for individuals. It's for large enterprises. It gives you everything you need to easily view, create, prepare, and very important to attorneys, sign PDF files, delivering more value through a clean UI, simple deployment options, and the best customer service in the business. You can easily connect and host documents in the Nitro Cloud, enable, enabling you to securely complete transactions with legally binding e-signatures. You can print to PDF from any application using the Nitro Pro virtual printer driver. You have simple one-click PDF conversions to any MS Office format and then back again. You can add text anywhere in a PDF document, even if it doesn't have interactive fields. How great is that? Don't think Adobe does that. Intuitive editing tools let you manipulate text, change fonts, customize layouts, and more. The Nitro Pro UI is based on the familiar Microsoft Office ribbon, so you're going to feel absolutely at home if you're a Microsoft Office person. You can transform any scanned document or image into a searchable and editable PDF with OCR. That's, of course, optical character recognition. You can offer feedback and collaborate with others using simple markup and review tools. And Nitro Pro is used by over half a million businesses, including 50% of the Fortune 500. So you'd better get on that bandwagon, and we're going to make it easy for you to do it. Visit GoNitro.com slash twit to learn more about Nitro and their document solutions. And as a special offer for fans of twit, you can even try it free for 14 days. No credit card or anything else required. That's GoNitro.com slash twit. Thank you so much, Nitro, for your support of This Week in Law. Let's move on and talk about power slash rangers. Um, okay, so I'm very sad. I did not actually manage to catch the 14-minute short film before uh, it was pulled off Vimeo and YouTube. I think it is still up on the producer Adi Shankar's uh, Facebook page, um, at least as of this morning when I checked it was, but I didn't have 14 minutes to watch it then. So hopefully after the show. Um, anyway, uh, again, if you were under a rock uh, in the last couple of days, um, uh, a um, let's see, we have, we've already mentioned the producer's name is Adi Shankar. Uh, the director, Joseph Kahn, uh, worked with him to put together a short film reboot of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, uh, which, you know, for anyone of a certain age, they were uh, probably a part of your childhood. Uh, and it's not just any old fanfic. Uh, we've got very well-recognized Hollywood stars uh, from the likes of Battlestar Galactica and Dawson's Creek, um, <laughs> starring in this wonderful feature, uh, short feature. Um, unfortunately, uh, the folks who own the rights to the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers um, have come in and, and pulled the copyright card and said, nope, sorry, uh, this particular work is not authorized by us. Uh, it, I'm wondering, you know, if 
possibly the producer and director are going to be able to rally some good legal support um, for their cause. Because I think there are some good arguments to be made here that, you know, they have not actually used any of the footage uh, from the Mighty Morphin Power Ranger franchise. Uh, apparently the producer got a cease and desist letter uh, concerning the music, claiming that the theme music had been used, but he denies that and said, no, we had an original score done. And uh, so again, I haven't listened, so I haven't been able to um, compare the theme music a la what the jury's going to be doing um, in the Blurred Lines trial that's uh, also underway right now. So um, let's kick this over to Debbie. Debbie, uh, did you get a chance to see the film? And uh, what do you think about the fair use analysis here? I didn't. And I hopefully like you will be able to see it in a little bit. I think mm -hmm. there's a couple parts of the commentary uh, that are, are helpful to see where most people come when they look at fair, fair use. So these would not be lawyers. These would not be judges. These would not be people trying to advocate for the four part analysis in a legal system, but more from a perspective of cultural creation. And so one of the things that the producer of this video said is I'm not trying to make money here, right? This was sort of something I did for fun. It was, again, in this case, very transformative, but based upon some characters that um, have this copyright cloud over them. And so that notion that this is not commercial, that they're not trying to make money, you see that a lot, especially in the comments on different kinds of transformative or fan fiction works on YouTube. Because for many people, that's sort of the boundary. But it's not, of course, the only boundary when you bring this into the court system. And that's another point that I think at, at the level of policy needs to be discussed that comes out of this case. Um, and, you know, some of the other comments I saw in relation to this were the you know original copyright owner is incredibly wealthy, that this is sort of a, a way of concentrating a level of economic wealth in a way that could potentially be more dispersed if we allowed for more cultural play and creativity. So it raises very similar questions, but in this case, because the appropriation is of a, of a very commercial commodity, it, there are larger power structures at play. You know, Sarah, it's not typical in the fair use analysis that uh, you would get the prong of, but we got really big name Hollywood stars to participate <laughs> in our fan fiction. Here we've got James Vanderbeek and Katie Sackhoff, and that lends sort of a legitimacy to the whole project, don't you think? Hmm, that's interesting. I might actually think that that hurts them a little bit because it makes it mm -hmm. feel more Hollywood and hence more commercial, I guess. More commercial, yep. Um, than something more amateur. I was going to say in response to Debbie, I completely agree with the kind of gut reaction to this sort of thing when it's non-commercial fan fiction. It feels like the sort of thing that should be a fair use. Um, I think as a legal matter, it's tricky um, or it's at least tr a little bit more complicated because obviously fan fiction overlaps greatly with the right to create derivative works. And so kind of drawing that line and um, I think is, is a little bit more complicated than it might seem like it should be. And even like, like I think it should be, but I mean, as a legal matter, I think it is a little bit more complicated. Also, I was, the other thing I was thinking about this when I saw it is regardless of the legal merits, I mean, what a terrible PR move. I mean, I, I don't understand how this is a good business decision. Um, they're going to get, a, you know, all this terrible publicity. Um, it just seems like I don't really, I don't really understand the logic behind the takedown here. Right. Well, we saw Professor Christopher Sprigman uh, zooming up on his jet ski to the rescue of left shark. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, does this strike you as something EFF might get involved in or, or some other um, copyright scholar? Yeah, I could definitely see that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, it, it seems like right up, not not only EFF, but, um, you know, Rebecca Tushnet or different scholars who are really invested mm -hmm. in the fan fiction space. I could definitely mm -hmm. see them getting involved in this case. Right. AJ, did you get to see it? I did not. I regret that deeply. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it's, I love, I love Battlestar Galactica and believe it or not, James Vanderbeek actually grew up in the same tiny town in the middle of Connecticut that I did. <laughs> I went to high school with his brother. He went to a private school. I went to a public school, so I didn't see him that much. But I did go to high school with his brother, you know. Uh, and it's just kind of hilarious that he's popping up on the radar again. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Uh, I did not see it, but it's, uh, you know, hopefully I'll get to. The whole thing is so interesting to me. Uh, the, the fact that copyright is such a big issue now is amazing because 
the confluence of so many factors, right? I mean, it's so much easier to create user-generated content now than it was 20 years ago with computers and being able to share it on the internet. So there's so many inst more instances of this kind of thing. Obviously, this is not, you know, this is a, a film that had a budget behind it for sure. But, you know, the llama thing for sure also. Uh, but at the same time, <laughs> it's also very easy to monetize. I think you mentioned that no one is expecting to make money off of this. But every, you know, no matter what people expect, you can make money off of anything now, right? Whatever page that you were watching that llama video on, I guarantee you there were ads on that page, right? Right. Uh, yeah, that's And an so someone's point. making money. And then finally... The other thing that makes everything so sticky, so you know, so convoluted now is that it's actually very easy to find instances of copyright violation. There are automated ways to figure out what a soundtrack is, you know, even looking at video footage, even if it's recorded off a of TV, you can sometimes tell that, hey, so that's my footage. So it's easier to generate the content, but it, and it's easier to monetize, and it's also easier to find out when, for the copyright holder, when they think you're violating that copyright. So it looks like, um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a heady days these days and trying to figure out what the heck to actually do with all this stuff. <laughs> right. Although I guess the counterpoint um, to, yes, you can, I, you can at least get an, a match for something that potentially violates your IP, but coming down to, you know, is it really um, a close enough match to constitute an infringement? That's what's going on in the um, blurred lines, Marvin mm -hmm. Gaye, Case that's a right tricky now. one for sure. That's yeah. very, very tricky. That's not a straight up sample, right? I mean, it's kind of a, hey, it sounds a lot like this song. What do you think? Um, right. And those are the ones that go to court, right? But for the ones where, hey, I made a video and I'm using this thing as a soundtrack, if, if you're the copyright holder for that soundtrack and you send a notice to YouTube, they will take it down, right? I mean, they're going to err on the mm -hmm. side of caution there. So um, everything, there's more stuff happening. There's more things getting taken down. It's, it's hard to even keep track of from, from my perspective as just a consumer who likes to watch crazy Power Rangers, you know, remakes or whatever. I'm missing out. <laughs> well, apparently I'm learning all kinds of interesting things from IRC while this discussion's going on, that there was a live action Thundercats fan fiction done <laughs> and uh, that there would be a market for the live action version of Voltron if someone were to uh, toss that out. Thank you, Virgil, for all your thoughts along those lines. Um, any, any other thoughts, Debbie, uh, as our copyright scholar on the show today? Well, I, it's really hard to know how to deal with the fair use criteria because of, um, as Sarah said, these are legal criteria and, um, many cases will get into the courts and then you get certain kinds of outcomes, which may or may not reflect our, our understanding, our, our less legal understanding of what might be fair use. So, you know, the, the digital world that we live in now poses different kinds of questions for how we appropriate and use things. And it's not as if we've always lived in a world where these lines that we have now existed. Those have been debated and uh, put forward through a variety of different legal challenges. And so there has to, there can be a larger public conversation about where we want to strike these balances. Right. And I, I think that uh, AJ raised an excellent point that um, the courts have not yet head on tackled yet at, in, in doing um, various fair use analysis in high profile cases. And that's this whole notion that um, if you're using a work commercially, that's going to count against you in the fair use analysis. And here we have the producer and the director flying their flag of, you know, we didn't Kickstarter this, we funded it ourselves, we filmed everything originally, we hired a cast, we wrote it, we, um, you know, as they say, composed an original score, um, and we're not charging anybody any money to see it. But then, but that's not the same thing as we're not making any money from it. You know, if you put it online and ads support it, there is a commercial aspect to it. And I'm, I'm wondering about your thoughts on that, Debbie. Well, there's also, I think, a commercial aspect on some, but I mean, for the original producer. So for the mm -hmm. llama video, I'm guessing that many people haven't thought of or heard the Benny Hill song. In fact, I didn't even know it was a Benny Hill song until this mm -hmm. moment. And so mm -hmm. it raises and enhances that um, much older cultural product, if you want to call it a product, and maybe gives it a new life. And so, so one of the things we seem to be trying to do, or at least what's happening in the digital world, is we're trying to monetize every single possible stream or use or click. And I think that we need a more complex and nuanced economic system for how money flows around creative works, because 
yes, some people are probably, and I think this is a really good point that AJ brought up, making money off of it through advertising. And that seems to be the model that we've we've brought with us to the internet. But there may be other ways we can think about how folks make money and how we monetize cultural works. And so I think musicians have started to think through those alternatives, possibly more so than some of the other kinds of media channels. So a video like the Power Rangers is maybe one of the first ways to think through it for video, what some musicians have been doing in terms of, well, we can do more live shows, we can directly connect with our fans. There are ways we can think about our creative work not in the way the industry itself sees it. So there's some, some things like that that we could start to look at. All just right. To, can I can I jump yeah, in please. quickly? Yeah, please. Um, mm-hmm. Just thinking a little bit about more more about what AJ said. Um, I can imagine that because content is so much, you know, more easily it's more easily monetized now, at least in small in small ways, I can imagine that could maybe make the commercial use factor less important. I mean, right now it's not transformativeness. You know, the first factor, the purpose um, is definitely the most important by far anyway, but it seems like um, it could just, it could affect the fair use analysis in the sense that, yeah, it'll still be considered, but it'll just be kind of less of a, less of an important factor in the final decision. Right. And I think, um, you know, what I'm coming away from this with is that the commercial factor is getting harder and harder to identify. It's not just, you know, I'm charging someone to see this work and profiting from that, that there's a more and more indirect aspect to the commercial fair use factor, whether it's um, supporting something with ads, which is a couple of steps removed, or just the fact that Joseph Kahn and Adi Shankar might not have been very well known in the industry, but after this film, uh, paying tribute to the Power Rangers, they will be. And so there's definitely, you know, an assistant to their careers in having made this. So I don't know. I mean, it's not really, I'm not answering my own question. I'm just thinking that um, as fair use develops, I think we will see um, courts massage that factor a bit and and try and come to terms with the fact that commercial use didn't doesn't mean today necessarily what what it might have been uh in the original fair use cases right. um, and of Sarah, course the, go ahead oh, sorry i was just say of course the i should clarify too that the you know the fair use factor isn't whether or not it's commercial or not it's the mm. effect of on the the market for the market. original work and so that's right. where um you know, the fact that this might be good for the PR, for the Power Rangers franchise would actually mm-hmm. maybe maybe come into the court's analysis. Yeah. So anyway, sorry to interrupt. Hey, no worries. <laughs> uh, before we lose you, because I know you have to run off and catch a plane, uh, you wanted to talk about the photo of the New York firefighters uh, erecting a flag, the one of many iconic photos of uh, the 9-11 tragedy that is also subject of a fair use lawsuit right now. Can you tell us what's going on there? Sure. So um, Fox was sued for um, one of its productions, production assistants um, posted that famous photo on, I think it was their Facebook page, um, next to um, another famous uh, war image um, and then used the hashtag never forget. And they were sued for copyright infringement and they made a motion for summary judgment that it was a fair use and they lost. Um, I think that this, from what I've read, and I haven't read the opinion, I have to say, but um, it sounds like what the court basically said was that there's some question about the, the first factor. There's a question of fact about whether or not the photo was used um, to comment on a controversy or, you know, or whether it was actually just used to promote viewership um, for Fox. And so um, I think there, you know, is a fairly non-controversial decision in that sense. Um, for me, I guess it kind of goes back to what Debbie was just talking about earlier, that this is the sort of thing that strikes the normal person as absurd to think that you would need to license this photo to put it on, your, you know, to post it on social media. So to me, it's just a, it's an example of where, you know, it might actually be kind of complicated question under copyright law, but under the normal person's reaction, it seems a little bit, um, a little bit crazy. At least to me, that's my reaction is that 
it just seems crazy to think you would need a license to post something on, even for Fox News. It's their social, you know, it's a Facebook page. It's not, it's not putting it on the front of their website or anything. So to me, it just, it doesn't kind of pass the normal person's smell test. <laughs> Debbie, what do you think about never forget as a commentary that might be uh, a factor in the fair use analysis? So for me, there is something about when commercial entities appropriate the works of others without, and because they are the major players in making copyright so hard for the rest of us. So for example, in, in many ways, I see this as parallel to when uh, Shakira, who works for Sony, and so for Sony, when they um, produced the anthem for the 2010 World Cup, uh, Waka Waka this time for Africa, but basically it's a remake or a, an appropriation of a song from a Cameroonian band, Golden Sounds. And for, for a, a, a company who's as IP vociferous as Sony to be appropriating other people's work without authorization strikes me as deeply hypocritical at the very least. And so Fox, I don't know Fox's particular approach to IP issues, but I'm guessing that it's fairly aggressive in protecting its own IP. And so I do want to hold them to the standards they would hold the rest of us to. Now, having said that, I agree with Sarah that there should be more flexibility in how things, especially in social media and the digital world, are, are used. Um, Obviously, attribution remains important and authorship, making sure that you attribute those to the right sources. But I'm so my personal preference would be more sharing. But if you are in a commercial world and are part of the, the system that is making the law so hard for us all, then you need to play by those rules like the people who you're enforcing them on. D does that distinction seem clear? I think it does. I know. Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. It's it's more sort of you know you, a consistency point. <laughs> that, right, uh, it's a consistency point. I mean, consistently, yeah. I would like the world to be more about sharing. But if you're going to have these laws and you're a major corporation that enforces them on others, then you should play by those same rules yourself. Right. Excellent point, um, Sarah. I know we've got to let you run to the airport. Uh, any final thoughts on this before we say goodbye? Um. No, I mean, I agree with Debbie that there's a lot of hypocrisy going on. I don't know about, well, actually, I think there is a case pending, and I just don't know what it, what the nature of it is, but where Fox is on the other side of a similar issue. So, yes, um, and I, I agree that people should eat their own dog food. Um, but I guess, <laughs> so just looking at it, I was kind of thinking about it from, you know, just this one case, I guess, to me, it, it feels like it's the type of thing that should be a fair use. But, um, but I also think that she makes a good point. Right, I and I think should make fair use. Yeah, we we put these uh, MCLE passphrases into the show for anybody who's listening uh, for continuing legal or other professional education credit. And Sarah, thank you so much before your departure for giving us an excellent MCLE passphrase for this episode. <laughs> uh, we'll put one more in before the show's over. But eat your own dog food is going to be the first. And uh, we sure. should just note before we conclude our, our discussion of the show is just because Fox lost its fair use argument on summary judgment. Um, doesn't mean that it would necessarily lose at trial and the case does go on. Of course, it, it does. It's kind of a blow to their case. Who knows if they'll um, continue to pursue it. Maybe there would be some kind of settlement, but but they do have the opportunity to go through and have a court go, th go through the fair use analysis at trial and see how they do. Um, so thanks for bringing that to our attention and thanks so much for joining us today, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I can't stay till the end, but it was fun. All right, great to have you, and we'll see you next week. All right, so uh, before we move on, I will thank our second sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law, and that is FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the cloud accounting software designed from the ground up for entrepreneurs, small businesses, and is perfect for attorneys. I use it in my own practice, and I really could not have my own solo practice without FreshBooks because it does all the back-end accounting for me in a way that's, seamless and uh, just works perfectly like clockwork without me having to really pay much attention to it. And, and when you've got a small business, that's what you want. Um, I've got, you know, a, I'm a solo practitioner and uh, if I did not have FreshBooks, I would have to have at least one staff member, right? To handle my accounting 
and billing needs, but FreshBooks uh, fills that need for me. So it allows me to operate lean and mean, just like I like to. And uh, it was just a wonderful thing to add to my practice because it serves so many functions. Um, for example, I, as a lawyer, I bill by the hour. Um, and it used to be that I would sort of glance up, you know, when I was beginning to start a project and try and remember to glance up when I was done. And um, there's a lot of estimating involved in that. But with FreshBooks, all you have to do is just open the app on your phone, start the timer, and just remember to turn the timer off when you're done. And it's actually going to capture that information and let you immediately convert it into something that winds up being money in the door, which is very exciting for a small business owner. Uh, it's built for a growing business. On average, FreshBooks customers double their revenue in the first 24 months and they get paid an average of five days faster. And that's because the FreshBooks invoices, even though I'm a small business, there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to have a professional presentation to my clients. And that's what FreshBooks gives me. Completely professional invoices, uh, that do not look like they were cobbled together from some sort of Excel spreadsheet. Um, also, you can set up reminders in case you haven't been paid uh, to, so that FreshBooks will actually reach out for you with an automated late payment reminder. That means you don't have to call up your client and bug them if something has just fallen through the cracks. You can set up recurring profiles if you have any automatic work that you do on a monthly basis or a regular basis for any kind of client. You just set that up to bill and it goes out and you only have to think of it when you're not doing that work for that client anymore. Uh, FreshBooks customers spend less time on paperwork, freeing up to two days a month to focus on the work that they really need to be focused on. Uh, do you keep your receipts in a shoebox? Don't do that. What you can do with FreshBooks is snap photos of receipts right from your phone and you instantly capture those expenses when you're traveling. Again, it goes right into your billing software and gets integrated into the statement that goes out for your client at the end of the month. You too can access instant financial reports so you can keep track of those expenses and be ready for tax time when it comes around as it uh, very much is right now. FreshBooks integrates with your apps. If you're a Google app user, PayPal user, Stripe, MailChimp, Fundbox, Zen Payroll, many more apps that FreshBooks just tightly seamlessly integrates with. And if you ever need help, making any of those integrations work or anything else, you'll talk to a real person every time and support is free forever. So give it a try right now for free with no obligation. You'll get a 30-day free trial by going to freshbooks.com slash twill. And don't forget to enter This Week in Law when they ask, how did you hear about us? Because it really gives us a leg up to let our sponsors know that we actually did alert you to their great service. Thank you so much, FreshBooks, for supporting this episode of This Week in Law. All right, uh, we've talked about a lot of copyright concerns, but I think we're gonna move on as we round out uh, into our last segment of the show here and uh, look at something that relates more to the field of privacy and security. All right, AJ, uh, this definitely crossed my radar this week, but I haven't paid a ton of attention to it. I'm sure Steve Gibson on our network has. Uh, he hosts Security Now, and uh, I'm sure this has given him much fodder for discussion, or at least will next week if he hasn't already talked about it. Uh, but this is the security issue that came up regarding Lenovo laptops that were um, sold uh, with Superfish on board. Can you explain what happened there and... Uh, uh, how this could happen in today's day and age. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think Lenovo laptops sold in the last year or so came preloaded with some software. Now, if you bought any kind of Windows PC, uh, you know the bloatware or crapware phenomenon where you kind of boot up your computer and in addition to the standard Windows installation, you have a bunch of other third-party software, uh, much of which is completely useless to you uh, and is usually put on there because... Uh, <clears throat> The manufacturer gets some money to do it. Um, for instance, an antivirus kind of software where you know Windows has a built-in antivirus uh, tool that works quite well. But if you can get a third-party software in there and start charging a user a fee, then that company makes money and they'll pay 
laptop vendors to put the software right on there. So what happened in this particular case is that Lenovo came and solved with the Super, super uh, Superfish tool. Um, and what Superfish did nominally, which already is crazy, but what it did nominally was when you searched on the web for various kinds of soft goods, it would insert into your results, like when you searched on Google, for instance, it would insert into results pictures of other things you could buy that looked like the things that you were looking for. So it's supposedly using, you know, a visual computer vision search technology to find, you know, if you're looking for, a, I guess, a couch, you would find another couch that looks similar to the couch you're looking for. Now, the thing it did that's most interesting is, um, is that it inserted the results directly on your page. So you'd actually see them alongside the other results. And now that to me already is crossing a line that I'm not comfortable with as a user. If I go to Google or I go to some site, I want to see the results from that site, not somewhere else. Um, so that was kind of what they nominally did. And that you can imagine is pretty annoying to people. Um, but, but you can install, uninstall the software if you wanted to. And so if you notice the Superfish thing, you could go and find it in your programs and features and get rid of it. So standard, irritating, bad stuff, but not end of the world, you know, new, really big news breaking stuff. It happens all the time. Unfortunately, what they also did and what they did to kind of enable this insertion of the results directly on the page is that they inserted, installed on your computer, a root security certificate. Um, and this certificate's the kind of thing where you might start, your eyes might start glazing over when I talk about some mumbo jumbo here, but I'll try to explain succinctly why this is so important and why this is such a big deal for people. And sadly, why you as a consumer need to even care about this stuff at all. Um, the way your computer works, right, when you connect to a website like Google or, uh, you know, your bank like Wells Fargo or Bank of America, you want to make sure you're actually connecting to that website, right? When you log on to wellsfargo.com, you want to be as sure as you can be that when you're going to that website, it's being served up by Wells, Far Wells Fargo and not by some third party hackers, right? So the way your computer verifies this, you'll notice when you go in Chrome or Firefox or IE or Safari, you'll see that kind of the, the lock icon, the secure icon mm -hmm. uh, and the URL indicating that, okay, um, it's saying that this is a trusted site. It is actually coming from wellsfargo.com, uh, from, from Wells Fargo, the entity. And the way it does that is using some fairly sophisticated security tools, and including that website publishing a security certificate that your computer can authenticate and say, yes, I trust this thing. I know that it's actually coming from Wells Fargo. And it's set up in such a way that a third-party hacker cannot provide such a certificate that your computer would get tricked by. It's very, very, very difficult to do this. It requires unbelievable amounts of computation. It just can't be done effectively. Right. So that's how your computer works, and that's why you trust when you go to Wells Fargo, I really am going to Wells Fargo. And the fundamental way that that works is at the end of the day, your computer on it stores locally a very small set of trusted certificates that it knows completely are completely legitimate, and anything that they say is okay, it will trust. So, it, you know, big providers of um, verification kind of players, you know, GoDaddy, you might have heard of them. They're a very big uh, <laughs> company. They actually have a certificate on your Windows machine and on your Mac, probably. Uh, and when you right. go to a, a site that's been signed by GoDaddy, you can look at your own local GoDaddy certificate and say, okay, this thing checks out and I trust this. And your computers are very, you know, the manufacturers and the writers of the software are very careful about what gets put into that trusted set. Because once you put something in there, everything it says is okay, you will think is okay. So that's generally how it works. And you trust a big company like Google, um, even a company like GoDaddy, you can trust, um, or at least you do trust, whether you want to or not. In this case, Superfish, a very, very small company, inserted its own certificate into your computer without telling you, and basically meant that it anything that you visited that it said was okay, you would, would look okay to you. And it absolutely does not have to be the actual right website. Um, people were able to crack that certificate almost immediately. And if I'm sitting in a, in a uh, cafe and I go to wellsfargo.com, if you're sitting next to me, you can actually intercept my communications. You can represent yourself as wellsfargo.com and put up a web page that looks like Wells Fargo. And because you've cracked my certificate, I'll think it looks fine. And when I type in my password, it's going to go to your computer and not Wells Fargo. That is the enormous security hole that happened because Superfish did this completely crazy thing. So that's why you need to care is if you have a Lenovo computer, you need to get out there. I think they've already... Microsoft has tried to clean this up. Lenovo's cleaning it up. It's probably gone by now. But until it was discovered, it was completely crazy that this is possible on a modern computer. It could be compromised right out of the box. You open it up, you go to your favorite website, and you could be hijacked. So that's the wow. story in some detail. And I can get into you know, who said who and who's to blame and all that other <laughs> stuff. But that's the gist of it is that it matters these days when you open up your computer 
you know, what it came with and what it's doing. These can do some really devious and terrible things. Right. I think it's a really good wake up call for computer manufacturers who, you know, we're talking about monetizing things and this is part of the way they um, maximize their computer sales dollars is to have these partnerships uh, with software companies who are going to put things on the computers that they ship with. And, uh, you know, that they need to pay attention to that. There's an awful lot of junk put on computers. And this one was junk with a capital J. In fact, it's so junky that there's going to be a lawsuit about this, correct? Oh, there already is. Yeah, absolutely. People are yeah. I'm sure some kind of class action is in the works. Right. And, and you know, I think it, we talk about um, uh, taco suits, which would be um, our shorthand for um, suits over things that you kind of shake your head and go, yeah, everything triggers a lawsuit. This is not in that category. I think this is something where um, you've got a respected, world-renowned computer company um, selling something that consumers think um, should be trustworthy out of the box. And and here it just wasn't based on the company deciding they were going to make an extra buck by putting this particular bit of code on there. Um, anything else you want to add to this? Um, I think you're absolutely right that the this, is, in many ways, though, is a horrible thing, is ultimately going to be a good thing because mm -hmm. it's going to expose what kind of goes on here. And you're completely correct that Lenovo puts this stuff on the computers to make money. They have very small margins. You know, extra 10 or 20 bucks per unit is, is a lot, right? Uh, mm -hmm. they, you know, they were very admirable in their response. They ultimately fessed up. They're actively removing the tool. But one thing they said was very duplicitous was, we put this on there because we thought users would like it. It would help them. <laughs> that, as, any, as a user, I have a Lenovo laptop. It's a wonderful machine, but I can guarantee you that that piece of software was not helping me and no one intended it to. It was a, a play to make money. Um, and right. I think moving forward, people are going to put pressure on companies to provide a cleaner, better install. You know, one of the great things that Apple has been able to do is say, we're going to do it our way or no way at all. When they release the iPhone on AT&T, it's going to be exactly the stuff we want on it. And when you buy an Android phone, you know, you get a bunch of other random stuff. Apple's able to say, we're going to do it this way. And I think you'll see more manufacturers pushing for that. Um, so I think ultimately it will be good, um, though it's, it, it's definitely a bad situation now. And there's going to be ramifications. There will be a lawsuit and there will be people whose computers will be exploitable until it's completely fixed. Right. I hope to see in the next year or two companies, you know, Lenovo, I think, is the biggest or second biggest PC seller in the world right now. There are going to be companies that are going to be changing their practices to, to tout the lack of bloatware as a feature, believe it or not. And I think that's good yeah. for the consumer. No, absolutely. We bought a um, PC in the last year uh, that just, we sort of randomly selected it from a company. I didn't know, you know, what their policies were on this, but they do not add any additional software. You know, there's some drivers that come with the computer that have, you know, diagnostic tools that come with the drivers, but that was it. There was nothing else on there and it was such That's wonderful. a wonderful feeling. Yes, CyberPower PC, I'll give them a plug. They're a gaming machine uh, <laughs> company. They were great. I mean, I really, really liked um, how the whole experience of setting that up with, you know, so refreshing. Um, so from, uh, before, before we leave uh, the Superfish issue, Debbie, uh, what do you think about the notion of not just, um, the computer company uh, manufacturer being held accountable here, but actually there being a little bit more attention paid to um, software that can lead to these kinds of vulnerabilities um, and the actual um, adware itself either being uh, reined in or regulated or held accountable in some way. Well, I can't say that I know much about code and I am a computer user, but not an expert in computers. But mm -hmm. again, these are these are important parts of public trust. And I think AJ made a very good point that if we, if we have trust in these systems, then they work for us. But if we lose that trust, then the digital world becomes a far less uh, safe place for us to be. Yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, from Superfish to Fish before the Supreme Court, um, this is a case that we talked about a while ago. I think when it was argued, uh, it's the case it's called Yates versus United States. No doubt about a grouper named Nate. Uh, and the reason I'm rhyming is because uh, that's what Justice Elena Kagan decided to do in her dissent. Uh, this is a case that I imagine, AJ, you're paying some pretty close attention to since you're in the litigation discovery space. And that's what this case was about. It was about um, what sort of records need to be preserved 
Uh, and there was an argument in this case. It involved a fisherman uh, who was under investigation for um, illegally catching undersized grouper. And uh, he, he, the government argued that under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, he was forbidden from destroying any record, document, or tangible object, tangible object being the operative term here, uh, that related to um, the federal government's ability to prosecute him. Um, now, the um, undersized grouper here did not get preserved. <laughs> so, hence, he wound up in the Supreme Court. And uh, it wound up being a really close Supreme Court decision uh, where the court uh, came down on the side that tangible objects are only objects that one can use to preserve information and not all objects in the physical world. Uh, but Justice Kagan took issue with that and thought a fish should be considered a tangible object and cited to see generally Dr. Seuss, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, 1960 uh, in her um, portion of the dissent. So, you know, the the witty Supreme Court members are entertaining themselves and us all. But um, is there there something more important going on here, AJ, as far as what qualifies as uh, something you have to preserve under socks? Oh, uh, God. Okay. <laughs> Fox on I socks. Mean, <laughs> I, I did, right. <laughs> To be honest with you, I love this not so much because it relates to my work, just because it's it's. I love the Supreme Court. And I love when they get quirky. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's funny for them to get. You know, even when, when they're making pointed, passive aggressive comments, they have a really <laughs> hilarious way of doing that. Um, I do think it's interesting though um, that when they talk about, I mean, the wording is I think it says in that article in, in, in Slate uh, forbids the destruction of any record, document, or tangible object with the intent to obstruct a federal investigation. Now, my reading as a layperson is that the fish is a completely tangible object. And I was surprised by um, how this kind of sorted out because, okay, clearly it was a piece of evidence, the crucial piece of evidence in this case, and um, they're okay with it. You know, you can, if, if you have, you know, a halibut <laughs> or uh, you have a shoe, right, or whatever it might be, you know, it's, it, that doesn't count. I mean, ultimately it's interesting because I think they actually hewed fairly closely to the intent of Sarbanes-Oxley and they kind of said, okay, what does it really mean in this context? It doesn't mean a fish. It means, you know, a hard drive. It means a, a you know, a box full of papers. So in that, mm -hmm. in that sense, um, you know, the letter of the law, I think they, they hewed close, you know, they interpret it in, the, in a probably the appropriate way, but it's the kind of thing for, where as a lay person, I look at it and say, well, that's crazy because this person clearly knew what they're doing and it had exactly the intent they wanted it to have. And it was clearly a piece of evidence that's tangible. So I can kind of see Kagan's frustration there, but I'm not enough of a scholar to figure out, you know, who the, who the right person is in all of this. <laughs> well, it was certainly the Supreme Court had trouble with it. It was a close decision. Right. Uh, Debbie, what do you think? Well, we certainly have different ideas of what's tangible and have struggled with that as things became digital, because now we look at things that never take on what I think even 30 years ago would have been a tangible form. Uh, mm -hmm. Like AG said, boxes of paper might be considered <laughs> tangible, but it's not as clear to me that the things that I see on my, and my computer is tangible, but are the things that are in it tangible, right? And even some of those early copyright debates, which required things to be quote unquote fixed in a tangible form, struggled right. with ta what tangibility meant when nothing was being put onto paper anymore. So it, it, it's a funny, it's a funny case. I do uh, appreciate that fish are no longer considered tangible. <laughs> right. And well, it does. This, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if this, this sort this decision could have repercussions in the copyright world, right? Because we're struggling all the time with um, whether certain things are uh, actually being sold or licensed uh, when you're buying music in uh, the iTunes store, for example, or, you know, what other, a book, an ebook, et cetera, what your rights are with respect to that intangible object as opposed to um, the book on your shelf or the CD uh, wasting away in your garage as you get ready to take it to Goodwill. <laughs> so uh, any, any thoughts on the, the intersection with copyright law as far as the court deciding that uh, here this was not a tangible object for evidentiary purposes? Uh, you mean the fish? 
Yeah, the fish. Versus, draw, draw, I'm trying to draw a connection here between a fish and a digital file, and maybe I'm failing. Okay. Um, I, I think um, one of the reasons that file sharing has become a big issue for, for copyright law is that people don't perceive these as tangible items in the same way they saw CDs or records or books. And, and that poses different kinds of questions for folks because they're no longer, and, you know, of course they also see it as their property, which is a whole different issue, but the tangibility issue where you're, I think that's an important dimension that makes file sharing much easier to do than, you know, well, mixed tapes or whatever the, the analog equivalent would have been. Mm-hmm. Hey, AJ, we um, have touched on what Everlaw does and uh, the kind of software that you're involved in, but I'm interested in, because you pay such attention to machine learning and that's something that comes up for us um, on the law and policy front all the time as machines get more and more capable of replacing us and <laughs> making decisions that otherwise humans would make. So I wanted to just kind of pick your brain on all of that since I think you um, pay closer attention to it on a daily basis than we do. And it's part and parcel of your business. Um, you know, what, back when I was practicing law for a large law firm and um, we were, we thought we were on the cutting edge of discovery technology. Um, we were OCRing everything and just being really happy if, Four times out of 10, we could pull up a document we were pretty sure was there uh, in the huge <laughs> stack. Um, I, I, you're doing a little bit better than that these days, aren't you? Yeah, I think so. I think the state of technology now has matured quite a bit. As far as getting data out of documents, for sure, things like OCR are, are, are good. I mean, they're definitely mm -hmm. not perfect. If you have handwritten documents, geez, I have terrible handwriting. I don't think any machine, I don't even know what I'm writing half the time. So those are problems. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will say that in general, the problem is, has moved towards one of uh, volume and understanding content rather than extracting the information. Almost all the data you get these days is digital anyway. You know, we're, rarely do we have to OCR. We do. We OCR documents, but it's rare. Most mm -hmm. of the time it's, oh, my goodness, we have five million emails now, right? And of those five million, you know, where are the hundred that are interesting? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not so much, you know, can we search the data? We absolutely can. So in that sense, that's largely a solved problem, but it's more like, can we understand the data? If we find the hundred that we think are relevant, even if we don't know exactly what search terms we have to put in to find it. And that I think is where the machine learning comes into play these days. Right. Um, are, are you able to, you know, in the discovery world today to not just locate things, but, but suggest, okay, you know, this might actually be relevant to this argument or, you know, even beyond that, suggesting arguments that could or should be made based on the record? Uh, great question. Um, we can do the former, but not the latter. So mm -hmm. the former is to say, and I like the word suggest, by the way, um, what we do is a lot of suggesting. Um, mm -hmm. Some people who are very bullish on artificial intelligence are pretty confident that the singularity is Neil and we're all going to be bowing to our, you know, robotic genius AI overlord soon. I don't think that's the case. Um, I don't think uh -huh. if you look at, take a hard look at AI now, we're a long ways off from anything like that. Uh, and especially in terms of practice of law. Uh, law is a fundamentally human endeavor. Um, it's decided in a courtroom by people or at least in a conference room by people when you're settling early. Uh, and the interpretation, you know, it's, it's interpreting human actions, human behaviors. And that's something that computers are, are okay at, but not amazing at. And um, anyone who's kind of claiming that the computer is going to go in and do your work for you at this point, we don't see that is going to be happening anywhere in the next half decade, decade out from where we are now. So what we're doing instead of replacing your work is we're, we're augmenting it. We're going to suggest stuff for you. So if you've got a million documents um, and you found, you know, maybe 100 or 200 or 300 that are relevant to a particular argument, we absolutely can understand those, the computer can analyze those documents, pull out commonalities and differences and figure out, you know, the rest of the 999,000 or so uh, of those, which ones are most likely to be relevant. And that's something you can absolutely do. Uh, and it will suggest to you say, hey, you know, if you want to find more stuff like this, here's where to start looking. Uh, holistically, mm -hmm. in a way that you know, putting in search terms can't work, it's going to look at the whole contents of these documents, and it can do it very, very quickly. So that's something that's pretty good. Uh, I would say it yields quite good results. It can save a lot of time when you're trying to find relevant documents. We are nowhere near close to the second thing you mentioned, which was to say, that's an argument that'll work in court. Here's another argument that will work in court. 
which is mm -hmm. awesome and what very good lawyers are very good at doing. Uh, I don't think anyone is working on anything close to that level of understanding of the context uh, and understanding of people. So that right. you know, lawyers who are good, good at that will have their jobs for a long time. Right. So I think that gives us our uh, second MCLE passphrase for the show, which is distant overlords, not necessarily <laughs> here with us right now. But yeah, yeah. it's not too um, hard to imagine. Um, certainly it would be desirable to uh, turn loose some machine intelligence on a big universe of data. You know, the way that law firms traditionally have turned loose a squadron of associates and, you know, partners sit back and say, okay, tell me what you come up with. Um, and and have, uh, you know, the initial pass through done electronically instead. Yeah, I mean, I guess just to clarify that, the initial mm -hmm. pass is always going to have to be done by humans, uh, at least mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future. And that's mm -hmm. because if you imagine, you know, let's say you have all the documents for a big company, um, depending on what the litigation is about, a completely different set of documents might be considered relevant, right? If it's about uh, embezzlement or fraud or something, it might be some subset of documents. If it's about um, discrimination in the workplace, it might be another. And you need a human to go in and say, okay, these are the ones that we think are interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. And once the humans get in there and start working, then you know we kind of have this um, symbiotic relationship where the humans feed more information to the, artificial, to, the, to the machine learning algorithm. It gets smarter. It refers more documents back to them to look at. It's a very virtuous cycle in terms of getting more work done efficiently and increasing your accuracy. Um, you can also use them uh, use the uh, machine learning to help you out. So you can find documents that it thinks are interesting, but that humans thought weren't interesting and you might've missed something there, right? So it can definitely help out in that regard in terms of catching things you might've missed along the way. All right. Uh, well, you might think that uh, when you hear about copyright trolls, uh, they're generally coming after uh, smaller players and trying to shake them down, not copyright trolls. Here I'm thinking in specifics about patent trolls. Um, smaller players trying to shake them down, trying to say, you know, we're, we're going to get a settlement out of you because you're not going to want to take this to trial. Uh, the opposite of that happened this week regarding Apple. So let's look at that on the patent front. So Apple is not a small player and $533 million is not a small number. Uh, can you tell us what happened here, AJ? Yeah, um, they were sued by what people commonly call a patent troll, which is a company that does not do anything except sue other people. Uh, they don't have any operations or create any products. Um, and Apple lost in this particular case as a huge settlement. Um, and so it's, it's one of these things that's kind of a big deal uh, in terms of, you know, People are watching this very carefully to see what happens on appeal. They're obviously going to appeal. Um, mm -hmm. The case was litigated in the Eastern District of Texas, which is really well known for being patent friendly. Um, you all, Almost often these trolls will try to litigate there because that's where they're going to get the most favorable result. It remains to be seen how Apple is going to stand up to the, you know, whether this, this verdict stands up as Apple appeals higher up the chain and moves out of, out of Texas. Um, to me, this is, by the way, very interesting because... Um, when you get sued for patent infringement, you can do one of a couple of things. You can go to court, which is what Apple chose, chose to do here, or you can contest the patent um, with the USPTO, and you can argue on the technical merits there. Um, when you go to court, you still are arguing on the technical merits, but whom you are convincing is a judge and a jury. Right? So you're convincing effectively lay people about some potentially very technically arcane concepts. And you kind of have to decide when you're going into this whether you think that's going to work to your advantage or your disadvantage. Um, and that to me is interesting that Apple went this way. They lost and they're going to appeal. And, you know, ultimately the reward may be reduced. They may not have to pay anything at all. Um, but they went here and they rolled the dice here and it didn't work out for them. Um, and there's a couple of reasons I can describe briefly about why I think companies are having to do this more rather than going straight to the PTO. Um, sure. Please tell us. Sure. So, I mean, if you're going to contest a patent, if you go to the PTO, um, you used to be able to go uh, and do something called an uh, inter partes reexamination where you would actually go and request, hey, you know, I don't think that this patent is legitimate. There's some prior art here. Uh, there's some published something that, you know, something got published or whatever evidence you have, an existing patent that it actually is not novel enough to be distinguished from, whatever. And you can go submit a request to the PTO and you pay some fee. And then a patent examiner who's skilled in your particular area will go and look at it and issue a ruling. Uh, generally speaking, when you do one of those things, any court case is 
tend to be stayed by the judge. So when the judge says, okay, the PTO is deciding this, we're going to put this on hold until that resolves. Now, what's really interesting is that a couple years ago, the USPTO changed its procedures from um, what's called from reexamination to inter partes review, where instead of having a single patent examiner look at this, which maybe people felt was uh, too few people making a, dis a determination that might be worth hundreds of millions of dollars, they now have uh, three people. But the three people critically are administrative law judges. They're not patent examiners. And to me, that seems more like your day in court. You're con convincing someone who's an expert in law, but not necessarily in technology. Uh, and that's, that's a challenge. If there's a very subtle technical nuance involved here, it may be difficult to convey it in a legal setting. And so that might be why Apple may decide, you know, we, there's, no, there's no way they can actually get easily in front of a patent examiner in an interactive format. There are other ways where they just kind of submit information and walk away uh, mm -hmm. because the court, the PTO just changed their procedure. So now at this point they say, well, they're going to talk to three judges at the PTO or we're going to go to court this way. And I think, you know, they ultimately decided to go to the court this way, the standard way in front of, uh, in Texas, and mm -hmm. they lost. But it's interesting to me from a technical perspective, if I get sued on the technical merits on, on something which has a very good, a very deep technical basis, and I want to argue on the technical merits, I don't have a lot of places I can go where I can be com confident that the person interpreting my case is going to have a lot of technical expertise in what I do. And to me, that's a little troubling. It, you know, as you've been talking through this, it occurs to me that maybe Apple and other companies are starting to bank on the fact that um, patent the the process of patent trolling uh, has been much in the news and um, negatively portrayed, and that maybe a lay jury uh, would start to look at you know, a non-practicing entity simply pursuing patents um, that it came by one way or another uh, in a negative way and, and might not um, treat them sympathetically in court. That's a wonderful point. It didn't happen this time, but it may happen mm -hmm. in the future. I mean, one thing you mentioned <laughs> earlier was we talked about tangibility, right? You know, is this fish tangible, you know, or for, for mm -hmm. copyright stuff, is, are things tangible? When you patent something, it usually has to relate to a physical object. You have to patent something that you can make physically. So when you make these software patents, it's kind of this really funny thing where you say, you know, all the software stuff, but at the beginning you say, there, I have a machine with some RAM and a processor that does all the software stuff. So every software patent has like this hypothetical machine just to make it physical. Um, but in reality, they're being contested all the time in court. They're known as what, you know, people view these as business process patents that are basically algorithmic to completely. The fact that they happen to have the word machine inserted at the beginning doesn't give them the air of an actual machine. It's just some software. So it's very possible that a lot of these patents, not this one in particular, I don't know the details of this, may start to be invalidated by the courts. Um, the Supreme Court in particular is taking a very skeptical eye to whether business processes or algorithmic patents are can be patented at all. You know, are these things really yeah. physical objects you can make? Or are they just ideas like math and you can't really patent math? Right. So, so we've got Apple fish, made. we've fish, right. we've got digital files and now patents <laughs> that all have yeah. this tangibility aspect to them. Uh, Debbie, you want to try and tie all that together? <laughs> well, a lot of it seems very far removed from the original constitutional language of progress for the arts and sciences, and especially mm -hmm. the patent troll example. And I think it is positive that now there's becoming a larger public awareness that um, something like a patent troll exists. And I think that we may see some legislative shift in that direction to help solve, quote unquote, solve that problem. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly, it seems like every uh, congressional term, there there is a movement toward patent reform. Um, our last such movement uh, was more administrative than substantive, but uh, it's certainly it's something the lawmakers seem to be paying attention to. So something to continue to watch. Uh, we're going to leave you with a resource and a tip of the week. Our resource of the week is going to be the Fair Use Week Tumblr uh, for many, many more examples of things that are fair use or could be fair use or should be fair use and fair use in action. Uh, if you go to fairuseweek.tumblr.com, uh, you will find it. And uh, the Harvard Library is uh, behind this and putting all, all kinds of great links up there. So um, if you're looking for examples of fair use or discussions of it, uh, it's a great place to go. And then our tip of the week um, has to do with licensing. Uh, and it's something that was uh, published on 
Medium by, oh gosh, Dimitri Tomet, Tometsis uh, from uh, a Dutch publication called De, De Correspondent. And um, it, there's a, um, this is basically a sort of a social experiment that's going on uh, at a site called Everyone a Spy. Um, and what they've specifically done here is gone through Flickr and found some very cute pictures of kids that are um, commercially Creative Commons licensed. So um, they, whether or not the um, posters of the photos knew it, uh, these photos are completely available under the licensing associated with them uh, for use on coffee mugs and t-shirts and other things you know, because they are licensed for commercial use. Um, and, per, you know, we're constantly talking about paying attention to privacy settings and things like Facebook. But uh, when you're, this is on the copyright side and yet bleeding over into the privacy front because of the way uh, these works are licensed. So our tip would be to read through this article and know what Creative Commons licensing uh, actually means to the works that you're posting places like Flickr or anywhere else um, where Creative Commons licensing is um, an option that's built in. It's a wonderful thing to use. It's a great way to get your works out there. And, you know, if you're a photographer or other kind of creator and you're trying to spread uh, the word about your work, it's just a fabulous thing to use. But if you are a parent who cares about not having your kid's image show up on a coffee mug for, sh for sale, you might have a different perspective on it. And I'm sorry that Sarah has already um, left us because she... Uh, is counsel for Creative Commons and I'm sure would have some good comments about this, but maybe we can catch those from her next week. But um, I, I liked that uh, uh, this was a nice sort of um, tangible <laughs> example <laughs> of um, why you actually need to pay attention to what you're clicking on when it comes to applying a license, for example, to something that you're uploading online. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show. Thank you so much, Sarah, who's already left us, and Debbie Halbert over in Hawaii. Wonderful that you could spend your morning with us today. Yes, thanks so much. And thanks for all the people on the chat line. It's been fabulous to watch that conversation happen too. Yeah, they, they're they wonderful. We love our IRC chatters and our whole audience uh, we really couldn't do this show without them. They're constantly giving us great suggestions and uh, throughout the show and between the shows. Um, and AJ Shankar from Everlaw, it's been really a pleasure talking to you. Uh, great to hear about what you're doing and get your insights on everything we've discussed today. Absolutely. Thanks, Denise. Thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks to everyone listening in too. This was quite a lot of fun. Yeah, it's always fun for us. We love doing this show. And like I said, we couldn't do it without our audience who are um, such part and parcel of how we generate ideas of things to talk about, keeping us in the loop about uh, the fun things happening online. So uh, keep it up, folks. We really uh, love what you do. Uh, you can get in touch with me uh, either via email. I'm Denise at twit.tv or um, on Twitter. You can hit me up there. I'm dhowell there. We have a Facebook page for the show, Google Plus page for the show. A great way to let us know um, about your thoughts on the topics we've discussed, things you think we should talk about in the future, guests you think we should invite on the show, uh, llamas you think we should be following as they're rounded up. You know, just keep us in the loop. We, uh, yeah, I have lots of other things going on in my life, as does Sarah. So we really rely on you guys to um, uh, let us know what's on your minds and uh, what's making you scratch your head on the legal front because we'd love to be able to explore those issues on the show. Uh, you can also email Sarah. She has her own email from uh, Twit as well, which is sarahp at twit.tv. Uh, if you've been joining us live, that's wonderful. We're glad that you could. We record every Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific time, uh, 1900 UTC this time of year. So um, great if you can do that. If you can't, don't worry about it because we are on demand for you as well at twit.tv slash twill on YouTube at our channel there. This Week in Law would be where you'd want to look for that uh, on the Roku box, on iTunes, various ways to uh, subscribe to the show are over on the Twit page. So however you join us, we're just thrilled that you do. And we will see you next week on This Week in Law. Take care. <laughs>